Well, blessed good morning and a happy love day to everyone. Uh, the great thing as Christians, we know that <clears throat> God has loved us in such a way that uh, we can celebrate love, not just one time a year, but every day of every year. I want to thank all those that were able to come out to the memorial service for uh, Verna. Um, if you didn't get a chance and, and don't know already, um, the memorial service is up on our YouTube page. There's a link uh, on our website as well. Um, <clears throat> but uh, despite that, of all that I did, <laughs> the fact that I was leading it, it, I think it went really well. So thank you for that. And uh, we're glad to have Joy back with us. I think she's going to be with us one more week and then head back home. So, um, <clears throat> this morning, I want to get back to what we talked about a couple weeks ago, and that was a lesson from the Gospel of John. Now, in that lesson, we were talking about John like a, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> like a piece of music, that <clears throat> he has this uh, music that goes louder and louder and louder, starts off soft, but louder and louder to this crescendo that is the death of Jesus Christ. And we talked about the main music are these miracles, these hand-picked miracles by John that are all designed to lead into faith into Jesus Christ, faith that leads to eternal life. And in that lesson, we talked about what we called the incidental music, the background music of the Gospel of John, in which we were talking about the Old Testament word pictures and how they, in a very, very soft way, underline these miracles leading up to that crescendo of the death of Jesus. Well, what I want to do is I want to get back to now looking at these miracles and it's one thing to say he handpicks these miracles to lead us into faith, into Jesus Christ. It's another thing to show you what actually he's teaching with those miracles. What is it that actually he's building faith in? What is it that we have to know about Jesus? And so we're going to take a look at those miracles. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about how people often view their life. You probably know some people that um, complain a lot about life, complain a lot about what's going on in this world. And so I call these some of the common life complaints. Uh, maybe you've had somebody say something like this to you, well, my life just simply stinks. I don't know how I got here, but I don't like it. I just don't have any quality of life. That's kind of a sad sentiment that somebody feels, isn't it? Or sometimes you might hear someone complain something like this. You know, no one really cares about me. Or those that do live so far away, I never hear from them. It's distance. Nobody cares about me. One of the things that um, makes me kind of laugh and thing I will not participate in is that someone gets on Facebook and try to, tries to prove whether they really have friends or not by, by putting some demand out there, you know, respond to this text or you're really not my friend. And I don't think that's what Facebook is all about. So I don't participate in that. But that's kind of this idea where people say, well, no one really cares about me. Or maybe you hear someone say something like this. I don't like what's going on in this world, but what can I do to change it? Nothing ever changes. It's just been going on like this forever. And there's a lot of people who look at life in a very negative way. And they, they make a habit of complaining about it. And maybe that's you listening this morning. And, and if that is, I'm glad, number one, that you can be honest. But number two, I hope that you'll consider what we're going to look at from the Gospel of John. Let's take a look at the very first miracle that John chooses to record. In fact, as you look at John chapter 2, and at the very end in verse 11, the very end of the miracle, 
Um, he says, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So as you look at this, John tells us this is the first miracle that Jesus has done since starting his ministry. This is the first miracle is done in Galilee. And so the miracle centers around this wedding in the, the, the city of the town of Cana, Cana of Galilee. I often title this wedding as the bad wedding or the embarrassing wedding, as we know for the, the story here. Weddings are important events. They were important events, social events back then as they are today. A family wants to do a great wedding. They do not want to be embarrassed. And there's certain social traditions and expectations that go along with it. Where this wedding, well, they ran out of wine. Imagine, if you will, you have this wedding. And it's this beautiful wedding ceremony. And now you come in to the reception. And it's going to be a buffet. And you start calling tables, you know, the, the wedding table and the family table and table two and three. And, and you get halfway through and all of a sudden you've run out of food. Imagine how embarrassed you would be. How angry. How panic stricken you would be. Well, it's kind of what's going on here. We have run out of wine. How does that happen? And so we have Jesus coming, and I would take it, most believe that this is some type of relative of Jesus' family. His, his mother is there, and it appears that she is in not just a guest, but some, some way of trying to help run this wedding uh, feast. And so as we said, John says this is the first miracle Jesus performed. But we need to point out that there are seven miracles that we consider to be these hand-picked miracles. But that's not exactly correct in that in chapter 1, the very first thing he tells us about Jesus is he's the creator. And that's an extraordinary miracle. And so the first miracle, in, in essence, is creation. The last miracle is what we would say, the miracle of all miracles, where Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He doesn't resurrect someone else, something he did three times in his ministry, but he resurrects himself. So if you want to be honest, there's about nine miracles. But what we mean by that is these are seven that he elaborates on that are, are, are leading up to that crescendo. The last one, the resurrection of Jesus, of course, is all part of that crescendo. Another interesting thing is as you look at this, as Jesus starts off his ministry, most of his ministry is going to be in this area of Galilee. But as he starts off his ministry, he starts off very, very, what we might say, silently. Not that he doesn't do a lot of teaching, he doesn't do a lot of miracles. After this wedding feast, he's going to go down to Jerusalem, and he's going to do all sorts of miracles. And Nicodemus is going to come down to him at night and, and say these words, We know you're a man of God, because no one can do the signs, the miracles that you do, unless God is with him. Well, that must mean he, he, he really showed his miraculous power in that first trip to Jerusalem. In fact, as you look at chapter 4, and look, if you would, at John 4, and in verse 46, as Jesus now comes back to Galilee, interesting, he comes and performs a second miracle at the same place, the first miracle, Cana. And in verse 46, therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. That's not the passage I want. I want, uh, where is it? Uh, verse 45. 
So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. For they themselves also went to the feast. So if you think about Jesus' introduction of miracles, it really takes place in Jerusalem in that first trip down to the feast and not so much in Galilee. In Galilee, the miraculous power comes out much slower than it does in Jerusalem. So let's take a look at John chapter 2. Let's go back to John chapter 2. And beginning in verse 1, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and disciples were invited to the wedding. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what, what, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. I want to stop right there just for a second. I want you to notice that you've got Jesus, and if John is correct, he hasn't done any miracle. So what is Mary expecting him to do? Who knows the, the power, the authority Jesus has? And so as Mary tries to solve this very embarrassing problem, we've run out of wine, I would imagine she's trying to do it very quiet, quietly. She's, she's trying to do it, you know, hey, they've run out of wine. Trying to fix this problem before anyone else finds out about it. But what does she expect Jesus to do? And so we have this, this story where I call it the Mary mystery. A lot of, I like to bring up this story in Bible class a lot of times because I, lot, I like to get a lot of comments to see how people look at Mary here. And then look at how Jesus responds to her. There's some people that look at Mary in a very negative way and, and that she shouldn't be you know, trying to show off her son. Is that what she's doing? Maybe. Um, there's some that look at what Jesus says to Mary as kind of troubling. It seems kind of disrespectful. And I like to, to see how people view Mary and, and, and this conversation she has with Jesus. But the answer is we just don't know what she was expecting. Was he expecting a miracle? Did she just know he's so amazing that we know he can fix it? I don't know how, but if there's anyone here at this wedding feast, he can do it. That perhaps is it. But the conversation between Jesus and Mary, as many have commented, and I agree, I believe what Jesus is trying to do is challenge Mary to stop looking at Jesus as her son, as her child, and start transitioning to look at him for what he came to be, the Christ, the Son, living God. You know, sometimes it's hard for, for mothers to look at their grown-up kids as adults, isn't it? It's hard to, to stop thinking about them as growing up and, and, and to stop thinking of them as kids. And so, I would imagine this is very challenging for Mary. But Jesus says, what? My hour hasn't come. Jesus knows, and this is really a theme of John, that talks about this hour that's coming. Jesus knows that he's come for a certain hour, and he's got to time it out just right. So sometimes there are miracles Jesus does, and he tells the person he's healed... Don't say anything. Don't tell anyone. There are times where Jesus has to stay out of the, the major towns and cities and stay out in the middle of nowhere because things are getting a little too heated a little too quickly. But I love these words by Mary in John chapter 2, verse 5. She does not argue with Jesus. She doesn't scold Jesus. 
Instead, she says nothing to Jesus. She says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. There's some mystery in this, right? We're not quite sure what's going on. But she says to the servants, no matter how crazy it sounds, no matter whatever he tells you, don't question it. Just do it. Isn't that what we have to do sometimes? I mean, let's face it. The things that Jesus has asked us to do, there's not, they're not what everyone else is doing. The things that and places Jesus brings us to or God brings us to, they're not always the places we want to go to. But, but what? We don't always have to understand why or what or how come. Sometimes we need to just follow the advice of Mary. Whatever he tells you, go and do. Because Mary knows when Jesus says, hey, this will fix the problem, it's going to fix the problem. When Jesus says, hey, this is going to help, this is going to be good for you, it's going to help, it's going to be good for you. I love those words. Whatever he says to you, do it. So now there were six stone water pots, verse 6, set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And so they filled them up to the brim. I love that. Jesus, or, or excuse me, the word of God has just the right amount of details to take away any type of alternate explanation. Here we're told that they go and fill the water pots, probably something maybe that looks something like I have pictured up here. And he says, fill them with water. And so they fill them with water to what? What's the, what's the detail there? I always preach how important details are. Fill them to the brim. In other words, there's nothing else that can fit into that, that jar. This is not an explanation. Well, they only filled it halfway. There was already some wine in there. Well, that wouldn't make any sense. They had run out of wine. These were completely filled with 100% H2O is the idea. In other words, when they, the water becomes wine, it is no other conclusion can be drawn. It is a bona fide miracle. In verse 8, he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water which had come, become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. I, I, I kind of think that's funny because... We have this embarrassing situation in this important social event of a wedding. We've run out of wine. Jesus fixed this. And he fixes it. But it leads to another embarrassing situation. And that is, you haven't served the best wine. You, 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 you're not meeting the custom of the time. You save the best wine for later. No one does that. You've embarrassed your host. And so it's interesting. We go from one embarrassing situation to another embarrassing situation. But that's the problem. That's the fact. You and I get to know what's going on here. That Jesus has saved the bad wedding. That they did serve the best what wine first. They did. But the problem is that was from man. That's what man can produce. But when Jesus involves himself in what it is, this very first miracle, what? He's creating something. It, it, it's a, a, a reflection of Jesus as back in chapter 1 as the creator. He's the one that created the water. He's the one that created the grapevine. Surely if he wants to turn water into wine, his own creation, he can do that. And not only will he do that, 
it will far exceed any that man can ever make. So what do we have here? We have this incredible miracle that shows us that Jesus has the power over quality. Jesus, when he creates something, he creates it with quality. He creates the best thing. I kind of wonder about this miracle. This is a little bit different than, than other miracles where Jesus in front of multitudes heals a lame man and they see this lame man pick up his pallet and walk or touches a leper, something you just don't do. And the leprosy is gone and everyone sees it. I wonder how many people actually know what's happened here. In fact, in the text, it tells us the head waiter did, didn't know where, where this wine came from. We don't know because of verse 11, the disciples knew of it. And they believe in him. And there's that faith building statement. They saw it. They knew it. They learned of it. And they believed. Maybe the word spread around the wedding as to what happened here. But is there a really quite the splendor? Is, where's the amazement in this? This is a very, very um, interesting first miracle that some may not have even known that a miracle took place. But what happens is Jesus creates this wine. He solves the problem. He creates the best tasting wine. What does that tell us about what Jesus can do for us? Well, I want to ask this question before we move on to the second miracle. Can man improve on Jesus's creation? Here's a miracle that's, that, that answers that question. No. <laughs> we saw they serve the best wine, man's wine, and then Jesus and his wine later, and <laughs> there was an embarrassment. Jesus' wine was so superior. They thought that the bad wine was the wine served first. And I think that's such an important point. That there's this idea of where, where man comes to focus on the church that Jesus Christ built. And there's so many churches out there. Why is that? Why isn't there just one? Why isn't there just the one that Jesus built? Well, if we're really honest... There's a lot of churches out there because men think that they can do better. They can add this or take away this or change this. There's this idea that the church from the first century has to evolve to meet the culture of the time. What men will be attracted to. That's how we're going to fill in the pews. But there's one thing that's constant through John, and that is that Jesus and his ministry is not about just sheer numbers. In fact, in one of these miracles, we'll make the point where Jesus says, don't follow me because of my miracles. Don't follow me just because I can feed you physical food. Over and over, Jesus wants people to believe in him for the right reason. And I think we need to be careful to think we can improve our song service by changing the certain songs we sing or how many verses we sing or, or any type of physical outward change. What we really need to do is we need to become in knowledge and in practice of what Jesus has created to the best of our ability. Let's take a look at the second miracle that John chooses. And interestingly, as we talked about at the beginning, this is done in the same city. Jesus has gone down to his first trip to Jerusalem for the feast. And now he's making his way back to Galilee. And he goes right where he left off in Cain of Galilee. Here's a miracle 
that as the New American Standard has, it involves a royal official. Others have noblemen. But let's take a look at what happens here in verse 46. John 4, beginning in verse 46. Therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son heard him. And when he heard that Jesus had come, out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and to heal him, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke and started off. And as he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living, and inquired of them. Then they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed, and his whole household. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he came out of Judea into Galilee. The second sign in Galilee. Not the second miracle, but the second miracle he performs in Galilee. So let's take a look at this. What, what, is, Je what is John trying to teach us here? Well, number one... You've got a desperate situation. You've got a desperate father whose son is so sick, he's about to die. And when he hears that Jesus has come back to Galilee, he goes to him. Sometimes faith is strengthened due to circumstances. But what I mean by that is, I wonder, does this man really have a lot of faith in the ability of Jesus to heal his son? Does he really believe that Jesus can do it? I'm not sure. I mean, when you get desperate, when you have no other uh, choices, it's real easy to believe in some of the most ridiculous things. This man has no other option but to believe in Jesus. But as we ask that question, by the end of this miracle, this man indeed believes in Jesus. And there's a certain test that Jesus does to this royal official to see just what kind of faith he has. To see if it's just due to desperation or if he truly believes. And I think what we have here is something very, very common. There are people that come to believe in Jesus or will give Jesus an opportunity out of sheer desperation. We, we would wish it would be that way. We wish that people would have strong faith, that they would see the, the magnificence of Jesus as we do. But sometimes people have to hit rock bottom. Sometimes people have to be desperate in order to really see what Jesus can do for them. Sometimes there's a test, like there's going to be for this royal official. So as we get to this man finding Jesus, there does seem to be some faith. Again, maybe because of desperation, maybe some true faith. And so we have faith, but this is one thing that John shows us quite a bit about the faith of people in, in Jesus' days, even the faith of his disciples, that they believe in Jesus, that he has certain powers, but they often put limits on Jesus. And look, if you will, as this man finally catches up to Jesus. And he says to him, what? 
he implored him, verse 47, to come down and to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And again, in, in verse 49, he says, Sir, come down before my child dies. In other words, what he wants Jesus to do is he wants Jesus to drop everything he's doing and come and be present to heal his son. Let's just grant he, 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 he it does have faith that Jesus can perform this miracle, that Jesus can heal him, but what? In his mind, here's the limitation, Jesus has to be present. Come down and be at the side, the bedside of my child, so that you can do this miracle. And keep in mind, where's Jesus? He's in Cana. Where's the son? He's in Capernaum. There's, there's miles that Jesus would have to walk to get to that bedside. Faith with limits. I want to ask you, I know you believe in Jesus, but do you put limits on him? A lot of times we put limits on God and his son Jesus, what? Through our prayers. Sometimes by not praying for what Jesus could help us with, what God could help us with. And so, Jesus simply says to him, 50, go. Your son lives. And started off. You see what Jesus does here is he's going to, to heal this man's son, but what he does is a little test. Go, your son lives. Well, do you see what's going on here? As soon as this man leaves Jesus, it's going to be a while before he gets back home to see if what Jesus said is actually true. He's got to be assured himself before he leaves the presence of Jesus. Who knows where Jesus is going? Who knows if he'll be able to encounter him once again? He has to be assured that what Jesus has said actually takes place. Because he's not going to have enough time to go and try to find Jesus again. His son will be dead. But this man does believe. And so he leaves. Boy, can you imagine the anxiety slash hope that this man has as he walks all the way back from Cana to Capernaum? And the good news that he receives, and he knows exactly what when this happened, they tell him the seventh hour. And whatever faith he had with limits, it becomes even stronger. As the end of the text tells us that in verse 53, he himself believed and his whole household. They become believers and probably even disciples of Jesus at that point. But what does this tell us about Jesus? What are we learning about Jesus? What is John trying to get us to see? Well, Jesus has power. Power over distance. Power over space. There is nothing that makes Jesus too far away. There's nothing where, where God is, is just so far gone that he doesn't have time for us. He has the power over distance. He doesn't need to be present to heal someone. He can just say the word. This man was challenged to believe that, and he did, and he grew stronger in his faith. And let's look at one more before we close, and we'll come back to this and look at the other miracles. Let's go to the next one, John Chapter 5, where is Jesus? He's back in Jerusalem, second trip to Jerusalem. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. 
And in these lay a multitude of those who are sick and blind and lame and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well for whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up. Well, picked up his pallet and began to walk. It was the Sabbath on that day. Now, I want you to notice some things here. We've got another desperate situation. Here's a man who thinks he has found a source of healing, but, but what is it? It, it? Well, I believe this is just superstition. Desperation often turns into superstition. You hear all sorts of things of people telling you this will cure this and that will cure this and you try them all and nothing happens. I think that's what's going on here. Look at all the, the requirements that, that have to happen for someone to be healed. Number one, an angel has to come and stir the waters. And then there's a mad dash once that happens. And the first one in the water, I don't know if it's like your first toe in the water, your first whole body in the water, I don't know. That one gets well and everyone else doesn't. But what we need to understand is superstition might lead to hope, but ultimately we see what it is. It's false hope. And these miracles are trying to show us that you don't have to believe in superstition when you have Jesus. You don't have to worry about desperation when you have Jesus. Two stories about two desperate men. One, desperate because of what is happening to someone else. And the other one, desperate for what's happening to him. Healing that he believes in his mind so close, but so far away. He didn't know how close he was when Jesus came on that day. We are told that this man has been in his illness, this illness that brings about him being lame for a long time, 38 years. There's no doctor that can heal him. There's no cure for this. I would imagine that had a lot to do with the superstition that this man believed in. But what happens is Jesus comes to him. And I would imagine Jesus has chosen this man because of all those that are gathered around the pool, he's the most handicapped. He's the one that if you did like everyone in the water, he'd be the last one in. Jesus comes to him. And he says, do you want to be well? Of course. That's why he's been trying to, to get well with the superstitious pool. But he can't do it. And so with seven simple words, Jesus heals this man. This man takes up his pallet and he walks. Something he hadn't done for 38 years. He didn't need an angel to steer the waters. He didn't need to try to crawl, be the first one. That... Jesus said, pick up your pallet and walk. Simple. What does it tell us? It doesn't matter how long you've been sick. It doesn't matter if there's no cure in the world. It doesn't matter if there's no doctor that knows how to bring a solution to this problem. Jesus has power over time. Power over desperate situations. Power over hopelessness. And so as we bring our lesson to a close, let's take a look back at life's complaints 
and see. What's the answer here? The answer is Jesus. My life stinks. Well, let Jesus take over your life. Because Jesus has come to give up His life that we might have the best quality of life. Heaven is not on this earth. We are working towards that quality of life that will last not temporarily, but eternally. But even in this life, with the love of God and the knowledge of the Spirit, we have this physical life as well. Nobody cares about me. Everyone is so far away. I, I never hear from anybody. Well, when you have Jesus, guess what? Distance is not a problem. One of the things about the pagans is that they, 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 they thought the gods were so far away and, and so busy that they, they just had no time for the people and they had to do remarkable things, ridiculous things to try to appeal or, or, or gain the attention of the gods. Like cutting themselves, injuring themselves, that maybe the gods would take notice. That's not the way Jesus is. That's not the way God is. He's never too far. He's right there in your heart and in your mind. If you let him be. Every time you pick up the prayer phone, Nothing ever changed. I, I hate the way the world is going. I'll tell you what. It changes with God. It changes with Jesus. Time is no obstacle. And one day what we think is just daily life is going to come to an end. And everything's going to change. And those that have turned their life and come close to Jesus and given Him all of their time and devotion are going to enter into the most exciting, worthwhile life one can know. Not on this earth. Not in this world. But the world to come. These are all things we need to know about Jesus. Jesus. To understand the crescendo of John's gospel. Thank you.